I waited my whole life for this. For hardcore tennis fans who can't watch as many matches or keep up with the latest gist just because life got in the way, I've come up with something special for you. So the 2024 tennis season is up and running, and just about three weeks into the year, we've already seen some of the craziest drama on both tours. Here's what's happened this week. The Australian Open is still Novak Djokovic's backyard, at least until he's 67 years old. Croatian qualifier Dino Prismic is as good as advertised, and we can say the same for WTA teenage sensation Mira Andreva. Meanwhile, Alexander Zverev could be in hot water after having been accused once again of domestic violence. Also, many fans ain't quite sure what to make of Rafael Nadal's deal with the Saudi Tennis Federation. And finally, time might be up for the old guards. Andy Murray, Stan Wawrinka, Richard Gasquet, Marin Cilic, and Gael Monfils. And it's the same old story for Dominic Thiem. Wait a sec, there were also a couple of upsets. So, how did we get here? On Saturday, we saw something special. Yuri Lehechka won his maiden ATP title as the seventh seed in Adelaide after beating Jack Draper in the final in what was a battle of hard-hitting 22-year-olds, 4-6-6-4-6-3. So, a bit about Lehechka. We know that he's a clean ball striker on both wings. In fact, he reminds some people of his compatriot and former Czech player Tomas Berdych with his shot making. Remember, he made the quarterfinal of the Australian Open last year after beating Cam Nori and FAA along the way. Lehechka also beat Tommy Paul at Wimbledon, and fast forward to this year's Adelaide Open, and we had the Czech getting the better of Seb Korda in the semis, and Nico Jari in the quarterfinal. Does Lehechka have top 10 potential in him? Possibly in the next few years, he should get there if he keeps developing this way. We also had another first-time ATP title winner with Alejandro Tavillo being the last man standing at the ASB Classic Tournament in Auckland. Interestingly, he won the tournament as a qualifier, and if you asked many people, no one saw it coming. The 26-year-old Tabio dropped one set across six matches, including two in qualifying as he became the first Chilean to win a tour-level hardcore title since Fernando Gonzalez in 2007. The result also meant that Tabio had broken into the top 50 for the first time in his career. Born in Canada, the Chilean was a top junior in Canada back in the day, but didn't really get much support before switching to Chile. Just a couple of months ago, Tabio had to go through the qualifiers to qualify for a challenger event. Although he saw an early exit at the Australian Open this year, his good defense and lateral movement should earn him more achievements moving forward. But if you thought the results of Saturday were a bit surprising, I wonder what you'd say about Sunday. So, it's day one of the Australian Open, and we've got an 18-year-old qualifier making his Grand Slam main draw debut against Novak Djokovic. Dino Prismic is the guy. Just last year, he won the Roland Garros Junior Boys title, and a couple months later, he was close to causing an upset. The match lasted almost four hours and quickly became Nole's longest first-round match in a Grand Slam. Well, he wouldn't be the first unheralded player to take a set off Novak. Remember Jack Draper and Holger Runa, and a couple of others have done it in the past as well. I mean, of Nole's 24 slams, he hasn't won any of them without dropping a set. You could fact check me on that though. So, taking a set off the GOAT wasn't that big a deal. In fact, on the one hand, Novak usually uses the early rounds to find his rhythm and doesn't usually peak until the later rounds, but seeing the way that Prismic pushed Novak with his crazy athleticism on full display, the effort that he put into every point, how long he he stayed in the long rallies, and how he maintained his intensity throughout was laudable. Novak would later admit that he felt like he was playing against himself at times, giving credit to the youngster for his performance. I'll tell you one thing, watch out for this kid, cause he plays even better on clay. Elsewhere, Taylor Fritz survived a tight five-setter against Facundo Adias Acosta. One day we might talk about Fritz's mental resolve when things aren't going his way, because I think it's pretty impressive. Andre Rublev also narrowly made it out of the first round with Thiago Sebothvild almost causing another upset again. Remember, he dumped Daniil Medvedev at the French Open last year. Perhaps the biggest news of the week popped up on Monday, and it has to do with Alexander Zverev. In one week, three big things happened for the German. Netflix's Breakpoint Season 2 came out and portrayed him as a protagonist, which in itself isn't bad, but I thought their depiction of Daniil Medvedev as a villain in Sasha's story was inaccurate in many ways, and it's why Daniil won't be watching the series. If you haven't checked it out yet, you totally should. Well, around the same time, Sasha was elected by fellow top players as part of the ATP Player Advisory Council. 
Now, both of those pieces of news wouldn't really have been a big deal if not for the accusations of physical abuse from a former girlfriend. There have been allegations of domestic violence made against the German by his former partner and mother of his child, Brenda Patea. Before Patea, Zverev has faced similar accusations from his ex-girlfriend, Olga Sharipova. Last year, he was given a penalty order by the court and fined 450,000 euros on the issue, but his lawyers quickly refuted the penalty order. The German will now stand trial in the month of May, although he doesn't have to attend the hearing in person. Now, this is a really disturbing and sensitive issue, but since we don't have all the facts to make an input, let's see how it plays out, but one thing I can confirm is that something weird happened on Tuesday. Oh, Dominic Thiem and Felix Auger Aliassim had a mouthwatering encounter. After FAA won the first two sets, I thought it was going to be a straightforward affair, and honestly zoned out a little bit myself. Well, until Team showed some fight and battled back to level 2-2 before losing the final set. I feel like Team has been a little unlucky with brutal draws at majors, but if he keeps it up with this level of play, especially after the second set, that would be good news because I still find the Austrian a very entertaining player to watch. For Felix Auger Aliassim, I feel like we really need to talk about him. Might just do an entire video about him, so make sure to smash that subscribe button so that you won't miss out on all the good stuff we have in store for you. We could talk about the fact that we saw extremely competitive matchups on Tuesday, with only 6 out of 20 ATP matches at the Australian Open ending in straight sets. Holger Runa, Sasha Zverev, Grigor Dimitra all had sets taken off them. Roman Safiulin had a surprising first round exit at the hands of Talon Griekspor. Funny how this shouldn't have been an upset on paper, since Greekspor is only a couple spots above Safiulin in the rankings, but still, that was a shocker. We could talk about all these, or something more interesting. You see, there's been a lot of back and forth among fans because of one man, Rafael Nadal. In fact, we just dropped a new video about him and how the Spaniard was the man to beat in his prime. But on Tuesday, Rafa became an ambassador for the Saudi Tennis Federation. Now, here's the thing. Many fans thought it was a horrible PR move and that Rafa sold out despite seeing the situation in Saudi Arabia. If you think Rafa did it for the money, doesn't he already have more than enough cash to his name? Others also suggested he's just doing it out of the love he has for the sport and simply wants to promote tennis in the Middle East. Another group of fans have said that there's an incentive to build his academy in the Middle East. I think he already has one in Kuwait though. But the word on the street is that it might be an empire building strategy for the Spaniard who might soon be retiring as a player. But let me ask you guys, what were your thoughts about the decision? Back to the courts, some other weird things happened on Monday. We saw Stefano Tsitsipas tinkering with his serve in his first round match against Zizou Bergs, and you begin to wonder what the hell this guy is actually doing. We saw him hitting serves with a pinpoint stance. He later mixed things up though and went back to his usual platform stance. Quite funny, because Tsitsipas is actually one of the best servers on tour and even had the second highest hold percentage in 2023, only behind Nole. Any idea why he did that? I thought we all agreed that he needed a permanent fix for his shabby backhand, or am I missing something here? How about this piece of magic from the Greek? Meanwhile, Andy Murray, Stan Wawrinka, and Milos Raonic all saw first round exits, and honestly, I keep wondering what's next for these legends. We also saw Sumit Nagal upset 31st seed Alexander Bublik in straight sets. Got a feel for the Bublik fans though. I wonder what they expect of him going into the tournaments these days. Nagal became the first Indian tennis player to defeat a seeded player in the singles of a main draw Grand Slam match since Ramesh Krishnan did it against then world number one and defending champion Mats Wielander in 1989. So many things to discuss guys. How about the rule change in this year's Australian Open that allows spectators to come in and out between every game? Game, rather than every second game in the changeovers. Some players have complained about it being disruptive, but do you think it's a genuine cause for concern? It's now Wednesday and the WTA is on fire. 16-year-old Mira Andreva has added another milestone to her collection. The 2023 WTA Newcomer of the Year stunned number 6 seed and 3-time Grand Slam finalist Ons Jabeur in the second round of the Australian Open, 6-love, six 6-2, six to earn her first career top 10 victory. She needed just 54 minutes on Melbourne's main court to do that. At this point, a crazy thought comes to my head. Do you think Andreva could pull off an Emma Raducanu run this year? She obviously has the talent and firepower to do so. Elsewhere, Naomi Osaka didn't make it past the first round after she got beaten by Caroline Garcia in straight sets on Monday. No worries, it's still the early days of her comeback to the sport, so hopefully we'll get to see more of Osaka in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, Arena Sabalenka, Iga Swiatek, Coco Gauff are doing what they know how to do best, which is winning. Paula Badosa's return has also been quite refreshing to see. Unfortunately, we won't be seeing more of Maria Sakkari at the Australian Open after she got upset by Alina Avanesian, who isn't even in the top 75. 
Another shocker there. Off the court, we saw Federer visiting Rafa's academy. Hmm, what are these two up to? So on Thursday, day five of the Australian Open, we saw arguably the best day of tennis all week. Lots of drama and the most thrilling Uno reverse on both tours. Iga Swiatek was down 1-4 against the hyper-aggressive 2022 Australian Open finalist Danielle Collins in the third set, but somehow managed to win the match. How did she do it? Iga had lost to Collins before in the semis over the Australian Open in 2022, and not many people remember that. By now, it's pretty clear to see that Iga struggles at times against hard-hitting players like Collins, Ostapenko, and Rybakina. History looked to repeat itself, but Iga dug deep to recover from a two-break deficit by winning the last five games. She served more to Collins' forehand, and unfortunately, the American ended up missing a lot of forehand returns. For the 30-year-old Collins, this will be her last year on the tour, and she's looking to start a family and do other things with her life. On the men's side, we saw Cameron Nori pull off a Houdini against world number 133 Giulio Zapieri after recovering from two sets down to win the match. The match had two rain delays and multiple medical timeouts, but it was Nori who would come out on top after the restart. For the young Italian Zapieri, he'll be looking to take some positives out of his time in Melbourne after upsetting Dusan Lajovic in the first round. Up next, we saw Alexander Zverev take on Lukas Klein, and if you watched the match, you might have felt Klein lost the match more than Zverev won it because of the numerous chances he had wasted. But still, you have to give credit to Zverev for sticking it out and simply not giving in. The match also lasted five sets, and it took a super tiebreak in the fifth to separate both players. The Slovakian qualifier didn't let Zverev find his rhythm for the most part in the match, but he was outdone by a couple of errors he had made in the clutch moments. It was Zverev's 400th tour-level win. Also, we had Kaspar Ruud surviving a five-set match against Max Purcell. It was just the second time in his career that Purcell would be playing a five-setter. Both players turned up the heat and were obliterating the balls every chance they got, but there was also a lot of variety on court too. Rude didn't just rely on his forehand, he needed every part of his game to beat Purcell, and you could see the relief on his face when he got the job done. I have a feeling this is going to be a good year for Casper Rude. We then saw a showdown between Tommy Paul and Jack Draper. Remember Draper beat Tommy Paul in Adelaide last week? Well, Tommy quickly learned his lesson and was able to beat Draper in four sets, and the match could have gone the distance like the previous matches, but Tommy saved a couple of set points in the fourth set and managed to close it out. High quality tennis there. The match between Misha Kecmanovic and Jan Lennard Struff also ended in five sets. I found this one a little funny because Kecmanovic wins the first set and literally doesn't show up in the second. He wins the third, then doesn't show up in the fourth, and then ends up coming out on top in the fifth. Was it some energy-saving strategy or what? I have no idea. It was almost a similar pattern with Jakub Menchik and Hubert Herkosh. Herkosh could only convert seven out of his 21 breakpoints, while Menchik converted two out of three, but Hubi was able to run away with the game in the fifth set. After that, we see Carlos Alcaraz reach 200 ATP matches after beating a resilient Lorenzo Sonego in four sets. This is just a regular highlight in the Carlos Alcaraz reel. The funny thing is, though, is that it wasn't even the only around-the-net shot he hit in the match. Carlos never disappoints. Dimitrov, FAA, Hugo Umber, and Greek Spore win their matches as well, but the upset of the day was seeing the 8th seeded Holger Runa lose to world number 122 Arthur Cazo. We recently made a video about Holger Runa, and we addressed many concerns about his game and technique in the video, but I personally didn't see this loss coming. But then again, you have to give credit to the young Frenchman for his incredible serve and punishing backhands when Runa came forward to the net. Kazo had beaten Holger a couple of times when they were younger, so we might want to keep an eye on him going forward. In the final match, we had Daniil Medvedev up against Emil Rusevori. Medi lost the first set and wasted a couple of set points in the second, which he also lost. Down two sets to love, he had to dig deep and rely on his mentality and endurance to win. But not before he invented a game called tennis bowling, tossing his racket and knocking over a couple of water bottles. This is gonna be on tennis TV, bro. Rusevori pushed the Russian and was clinical with his drop shots, and Medvedev found himself two points from defeat in the fourth set, but by the fifth set, Rusevori's legs were completely gone. The fact that Medvedev, Kaspar Ruud, and Zverev could have all been out of the tournament on the same day is mind-boggling. It's probably the toughest second round I've seen in many years. All the top guys were pushed to the limit, but were all able to pull off some Houdini acts. Back on the women's side, seeing Elena Rybakina lose to Anna Blinkova was such a bummer because I had her as one of my favorites for the title. Both players played the longest women's singles time break in Australian Open history. The feeling was indescribable. One of the points that stood out for me was the match point for Rybakina at 18-17. Blinkova's desire to win, her willpower even when at her physical limits, was everything. Nerve-wracking to say the least. Blinkova played the match of her life in a tiebreak that lasted over half an hour, and it's hard not to be happy for her. 
But Rybakina wasn't the only big name to lose on the day. Emma Raducanu saw her Australian Open run come to an end against Wang Yafan. Raducanu dealt with some physical issues and deserves some credit for finishing the match, but take no credit away from her opponent though. Emma says she's feeling more confident than ever, which is quite refreshing to hear. Jessica Pegula also joins in the high-profile losses on the day. Off the court, Nick Kyrgios revealed that he and Novak often share memes with each other on social media. Also remember that earlier in the week, Kyrgios jokingly asked Nole to reach out to him if he was disturbed by any heckler. Novak also revealed his desire to play a doubles match with Nick. Nick seems to be having so much fun with the tennis commentary, and it's been great to see, but we gotta wrap up Thursday at this point. What a day. It's a new day and Yannick Sinner continues to show no mercy to opponents. He's just running through everyone at this point. How far do you see him going? Meanwhile, you can also bank on Karen Hachinov to make the second week of a slam. How does he manage to do it time and time again? Taylor Fritz and Stefano Tsitsipas also make it to the fourth round. And Alex Dimonor wins in straight sets. The Aussie still hasn't dropped a set all tournament. Meanwhile, Andre Rublev beats Sebi Korda in straight sets to reach the second week of a Grand Slam for the 13th time. Rublev still hasn't lost a match this year, but I still don't get why he wasn't able to get a cricket off the court. Any idea? Elsewhere, Manorino is a man on a mission. He beat Ben Shelton in five sets. Guys, if you don't know, Manorino is the new five-set king. He has a 12-2 record in five sets over the last decade, losing only to Roger Federer and Andy Murray. Don't let it get to five sets against Adrian, guys. Well, except if you're Novak. All of Manorino's three matches at the Australian Open this year have been five-setters. Stan Wawrinka in the first, Jaime Munar in the second, and now Ben Shelton. The 35-year-old says that the secret to getting better with age has to do with tequila. Maybe I'll have a few shots this weekend and see how that turns out. Djokovic turns up against Tomas Martin Echeverri playing better than his previous two matches and winning in straight sets for the first time in this year's AO. The Joker also becomes the only player in the Open era to play at least 100 main draw matches in each of the four Grand Slams. He's 92-8 at the Australian Open, 92-16 at Roland Garros, 92-11 at Wimbledon, and 88-13 and at the US Open. He should be able to get to 100 wins in all the slams, and that would be crazy as hell. In his post-match conference, Nole says that Roger Federer didn't really like the way he behaved as a younger player, but insisted that he never lacked respect. The Serbian then reiterated that he had no issues with Ben Shelton's confidence. Everyone wanted to see Shelton and Nole meet in the fourth round, but Manorino was like, I'm still here, guys. So this is how the top half of the men's draw looks at this point. On the women's side, Arena Sabalenka decides to be selfish again and bagels Lesia Tsurenko 6-love, six 6-love. Six she has only lost six games in the three matches she's played. Y'all better be scared of the defending champion. Mira Andreva comes back from 5-1 down in the final set and saves match point to beat Diane Parry in a super tiebreak. I told you guys, she's that good. Her performances drew praise from Andy Murray and a couple of other legends, and you can tell that it only gets better from here. Coco Gauff is still going strong, but it's the end of the road for Paula Badosa. Unlike Thursday, Friday didn't come with too many surprises. If you want more of these videos every week, let us know in the comments below. Until next time, keep swinging.